Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture four. And in this segment, we're going to be taking a look at some of the physical consequences and also some examples of where we can experience centrifugal force. So that's gonna be the main topic for this segment. And just to sort of reemphasize this because I do feel it's so important, centrif centripetal and centrifugal forces are quote unquote apparent forces, meaning the reason that they occur is because of the fact that you're in a rotating reference frame, which is in fact a non-inertial reference frame. So if you're in an inertial reference frame, you won't experience these forces. The only reason these forces occur is if you're in, actually in a reference frame that's rotating or a non-inertial reference frame. And we sort of alluded to this in the very first lecture where we took a look at some examples of non-inertial reference frames. One of the examples that I gave, which might be worth reiterating, is the example of a merry-go-round or a carousel where you basically have a large wooden disc that has a bunch of pretty animals and benches on it. Uh, you put kids on there, maybe the parents go on there too, and then you spin the carousel around. And uh, since that carousel is spinning, albeit at a low rate of speed, there is a centrifugal force that you can experience, especially uh, especially if you're on a one that's moving very fast, but uh, typically the carousels are very slow moving. But if you are sensitive to it, then you can feel that force that's trying to move you away from the center of the, the center of the carousel, the center of the circle that the carousel is tracing out. So maybe that's something you can uh, look for the next time you go on a carousel or on a merry-go-round. And another example that I like to give is a highway clover leaf. And by one of those, I mean one of those silly little exits where they make you drive around a circle before you get back on your way. I think even some entrance ramps are built like that. But those are uh, those are always kind of fun to to deal with, making you uh, trying to make you dizzy as you're about to get on a highway or off the highway. But uh, uh, you do in fact experience this centrifugal force there. In fact, that's probably the best example when you're going around in that circle. You can really feel that centrifugal force trying to push you away from the circular path that you are tracing out. And of course, you can also feel as if you just make a simple turn. Uh, say you make a simple right-hand turn or left-hand turn in an intersection, you can feel that outward force trying to push you away from the circular trajectory that you are tracing out. So, and you can even see this in sort of the construction of highway clover leaves. You can see that the, the side of the road that's farthest from the center of the circle is built a little bit higher up, which allows the cars, which helps the cars maintain that circular path as they're going all around that clover leaf. So just something else that you can look for the next time that you get on one of those clover leaves. You'll see that the side of the road that's farthest from the circle is built a little bit higher off the ground than the side of the road that's closer to the center of the circle. And Another reference frame where this comes up is the reference frame of Earth. Since Earth does in fact rotate around, and it's a nice spherical object that rotates around, centrifugal force is also something that happens on Earth, although Earth rotates so slowly that we don't really feel centrifugal force. Well, I say slowly as a relative term. It's actually rotating very fast. It's just not something that we can experience. Uh, it's just not a force that we really feel because relatively speaking, the centrifugal force is pretty weak compared to uh, some of the other forces that we see on Earth, like gravity. But it does exist, and there are some physical consequences that arise from the fact that centrifugal force is acting on the Earth. And another physical consequence that comes from the Earth's rotation is something called the Coriolis force, which is something that we'll cover next lecture. But uh, just sort of something to keep in mind that centrifugal force is one consequence of the rotating Earth, but there is another one to be considered, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So just to sort of get your bearings on the Earth's system and the fact that it's rotating. So in this diagram, I'm looking at this from the perspective as this center point right here is the intersection between the prime meridian and the intersection between the equator. And the Earth is rotating something like this. And one thing that should be noted right away is that because of the Earth's axis of rotation, the centrifugal force is going to be different at different latitudes. Because remember, that centrifugal force expression is inversely related to the radius. So as you go, as you get towards higher levels, or as you go towards higher latitudes, then your radius gets smaller. Whereas you go closer to the equator, the radius gets larger. So centrifugal force does in fact vary as you go from one latitude to the next, as you go either toward the pole or toward the equator. And this might be kind of hard to visualize, so here I'll give you sort of a top-down perspective. So you can see how I have the, the radius for a centrifugal force highlighted in blue here, and then the Earth's radius is highlighted in this purple color. And this dotted line represents the radius for our centrifugal acceleration or our centripetal acceleration. And at this particular point, and so we have this blue line R, as I go down towards the equator, 
you can see that my value, my r would get longer. The the radius would in fact get longer, and that would also be reflected in it on this diagram here. So the rotate the circle that's being traced out by the Earth's rotation does in fact get larger as we go towards the equator and as we go towards the poles, it gets really small. So that's something to keep in mind as we go through this is the fact that the Earth's centrifugal force, and also we'll see later on the Coriolis force does this as well, but centrifugal force, the magnitude of the centrifugal force does in fact depend on what latitude you're at on the Earth. And one of the physical consequences that arises is the fact that the centrifugal force can oppose and even weaken the gravitational force. And that's something that we'll take a look at now. And the term for this is effective gravity. It's the fact that the centrifugal force and the force of gravity do oppose each other and can weaken each other as a result of the centrifugal force that's arising from the Earth's rotation. So just to sort of explore this in depth, force of gravity, of course, points toward the center of the circle. And the centrifugal force, remember, points away from the axis of rotation. So our centrifugal force would point something like this. So you can look at these two vectors and see that they do, in fact, point in opposite directions. So they are, in fact, opposing one another. And in fact, if we want to do a vector sum, so we take the uh, tail of this vector and put it on the tip of this vector. If we do it a, a vector sum, we can see that the force of gravity, at least in the x direction on this plot, is in fact a little bit weaker. The x component of gravity is in fact a little bit weaker. And we can also show that using some geometry that the overall force of the overall effective gravity is reduced by the fact that we have the centrifugal force here. So that's sort of a conceptual overview of what effective gravity is. It's the force of gravity and the centrifugal force opposing one another. And the reason why we have the centrifugal force is because the Earth is rotating. So now we can actually go about quantifying this. So you may remember from the previous segment that the centripetal acceleration is equal to the angular velocity squared times the radius that we're tracing out. And again, that's highlighted in blue here. Now the question becomes, how do we actually calculate what this radius is? Let me actually go back here and take a look at this diagram without all those extra graphics on it. So if we want to calculate what this length r is, which is highlighted in blue, we can use some trigonometry to accomplish that. So we know what the radius of Earth is. It's given by this line here and also by the purple line. So we know what the length of this, the hypotenuse of this triangle is. That's the Earth's radius. And we know that we have an adjacent side, r here. So we can use the cosine trigonometric function. Cosine phi will be equal to the adjacent side, r, over the Earth's radius, e. Or just solving for r, you would get that r is equal to the radius of Earth times the cosine of phi. And also, this angle phi corresponds to your latitude. So if phi is 0, you're at the equator. If phi is 90 degrees, then you're at the pole. So that's where this expression for r comes into effect. We use some trigonometry to derive the fact that r is, in fact, equal to the Earth's radius or the radius of our planet. It doesn't have to be Earth. It could be any planet at all. But the radius of our planet times the cosine of the latitude that we're at, some, wherever that might be on the planet. And the angular velocity of Earth is just 2 pi radians divided by 1 day, or 1 Earth day, which is approximately 2 pi radians divided by 86,400 seconds. If you want to work through the unit conversion to verify that 1 day is in fact 86,400 seconds, you're certainly welcome to. But uh, this is in fact taken to be true. And then if we want to, since these two vectors, since these since the gravity and the centrifugal force point in opposite directions, if we want to calculate the effective gravity, which is denoted by g sub e, then we simply take the force of gravity, g, and subtract it and uh, take the centrifugal force away from it. So we get g minus centrifugal force. And again, we can divide everything by mass to get the mass normalized force. So this will give us the effective gravitational acceleration is equal to gravitational acceleration minus the centrifugal force. And that's all color coded to the vectors up here in the diagram. So you can see in general, effect, the uh, centrifugal force does serve to weaken the effect of gravity on the Earth. So I'll go ahead and rewrite the equation up here. And I'll go ahead and pose the following question to you, which you're more than welcome to pause the video and answer for yourself, just sort of check your understanding. Where is the effect of gravity weakest? Is it weakest at the poles or is it weakest at the equator? So I'll give you a few seconds to sort of come to an answer.
And the answer to this question is effective gravity is weakest at the equator. And there are a couple of explanations there are a couple of explanations that you can use to substantiate this answer, but I'll go for more of a mathematical explanation, which is a little bit more straightforward. So if we consider a situation where we're at the equator, where our latitude is equal to zero degrees, and we take Earth's acceleration due to gravity to be 9.81 meters per second squared, and we just plug in all the values into here, so we plug in the angular velocity, Earth's radius, which is six, uh, 600, or 6,371 kilometers. If we plug all that information in, we get that the effective gravity is equal to 9.78 meters per second squared at the equator. But at the poles, we plug all that information in, we get that the effective gravity is essentially unchanged. If the centrifugal force has basically no effect on the gravitational field at the poles, so we get that the effective gravity is essentially just uh, regular gravity, since centrifugal force and gravity vectors point perpendicular to each other, so they don't really cancel each other out. So, in short, gravity seems to be weaker at the equator, and again, that's due to the fact that we have a centrifugal force, and the reason why we have a centrifugal force is the fact that Earth is, in fact, a rotating or non-inertial reference frame. Now, this also has another interesting physical consequence, the fact that the gravity is a little bit weaker at the equator than it is at the poles. So if you can imagine the force of gravity holding Earth together as a giant spherical object, if gravity is effectively weaker at the equator, then at the poles, that means that this mass here has a chance to sort of bulge around the equator. So due to this centrifugal force, Earth does in fact have a slight bulge around the equator, so it's not a perfect sphere. It's more of an ellipsoid shape, if you're familiar with that, which is like, it's like a sphere, but you are you have a oval-shaped faces if you look at it from a certain perspective. But this does in fact explain why the Earth sort of bulges, and it's not a terribly large difference in this grand scheme of things. It's like, if I remember the number correctly, it's like a few dozen kilometers. And if you think about that in the grand scheme of Earth's radius, which is several thousand kilometers, it's basically not even noticeable to the naked eye. But it's an effect that we can actually observe. And again, that's just due to the fact that we have this rotating reference frame. So that causes the Earth to sort of bulge around the equator as a result. So that's going to do it for this segment, and in the next segment we'll take a look at a problem that deals with effective gravity to again sort of check your understanding. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.